I know most of you, so this ought to be kind of a fun discussion. If I don't know you, um, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I prepared this presentation based off of teaching, I think I'm on my eighth semester, not just at Utah State, but at both Dixie State and Purdue University and then here of teaching a class called interpersonal communication. So I apologize if mine leans more towards the oral communication. Um, I do uh, have practice with, with written communication, especially through my two graduate programs, but uh, it'll be a little bit heavier on the oral communication today. Uh, at least that's kind of what I was feeling. So I, like you, was a student at Utah State. Um, Marin will remember uh, Blake and Bo running around this building and Barbara. Um, when I was here. So I, I came in 2006 as a freshman, uh, was here for a year, uh, actually came to Utah State for the tennis team. That was, that was kind of my main interest in Utah State. Um, and then uh, I met my wife as a tour guide. Uh, so that was kind of fun. Uh, I went on a tour the other day and it gave me all sorts of, of memories of those days. So one thing I wanted to start off with, and you'll get to know me a little bit better here, but what's the difference between credibility and relatability? What do you think? Uh, credibility, that makes me think of um, like you have things to back up what you're saying and relatability is just that you can uh, connect with other people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you are giving a presentation, and, and my focus is a little bit more on the, the workplace, right? When you're with your colleagues at work, uh, but it still works this same concept between a big, large audience that you're trying to present in front of, or even just an interpersonal, you know, date that you're, that you're on. If you're on a date with somebody and all they're doing is trying to push credibility down your throat, they're gonna come across as an arrogant kind of jerk, right? Um, but if they're being a little too relatable, you are like, I can't see myself being with this person. They're kind of, you know, the fool. I, I remember dates like that where I was either being a little too heavy on one of those ways or, or she was. One of the things that I've been trying to convince my wife to do uh, with our Christmas card is to do kind of an idea where on one side we would have your stereotypical photoshopped beautiful picture of the family, right? So this, this photo cost about $600, okay? Just to get this one photo. So if you consider all the clothes, my time, actually it's probably a lot more than $600 if you consider my time. Um, but the clothes, the photographer, the driving, the Photoshop editing, three heads on this picture are from different pictures <laughs> that have been Photoshopped into making this perfect picture that sits on a 60 by 60 canvas in my home, okay? I mean, my wife, bless her heart, loves this crap, okay? And I just don't. And I will only agree to one family picture day every two years. Okay, that's it, and, and that was an established rule in our home. So what I thought on the Christmas card would be to put me on one side, this picture on one side, and just brag the hell out of our family, right? Like, oh my gosh, Elsie's just killing it in the theater world. Stacy's the lead choreographer for this. Blake's finished his PhD, just like just lay it on thick, right? But then on the other side, put pictures that are maybe like a little more relatable to what I actually look like during a day, right? This is a little bit more what I look like during a regular day. So maybe a picture of my family. Sam can come over, he's my cousin. He can take a picture of our family just at our house when we're all in sweats or something. And then just talk all about all the crap that's happened that year, right? Like Max went through this huge like hemorrhoid spell for like a month and we really struggled financially during this one month because we overdid it. And, you know, just be really honest about. So I think that would be the coolest Christmas card ever on front and back. Do you guys think so? My wife won't do it. But um, when I talk about credibility versus relatability, this is my number one point. You have to balance this every day at work or school with your friends and really importantly with your colleagues. You have to come across when you're either speaking to someone or in meetings or whatever it is as a very credible person, but you have to remember the relatability. We're all people. And I would actually say that when you're interviewing, for example, 
your credibility and the career services specialist can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think that your credibility comes more across through written communication and your relatability should come through more with the oral communication. I've had interviews where I've probably interviewed, you know, dozens if not hundreds of people for jobs in my last 10 years. And I can't tell you how many times that I've hired somebody more because their personality fit with me than their credibility was higher than someone else. Do you guys agree with that? It's all about fit in that end. But you can't even get to that final interview if you're not credible. Okay? That's why we get degrees. That's why we list our accomplishments. That's why you can be a little bit more arrogant on a resume than you can in person. Okay? Well, you could try it in person, but it's not going to go over very well. Okay, I wanna show you this video. Cause when you're on YouTube at two in the morning, this is the kind of crap you come across. Fine tune the color. Now let's get down to basics. A basically beautiful you. Yeah. Put some color in your life. You'll be amazed what it can do. This is the best thing ever. Guys, this is a this is a <laughs> this is a uh, training on what kind of colors to, to wear to make yourself more beautiful. This is an hour. I watched like 30 minutes of this. This is great. And the best part is, once you find your I know. The rest is easy. You'll have 30 special colors that will put some color in your life. Yes, I love the song. Marty, Michelle, Paula, and Susie are students like you. Take a close look at them. Each of them are very lovely ladies, but they're not as attractive as they can be. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite line. That was the best. It's like they're not as attractive as they can be. All right, so uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, okay, so the reason I bring this up is I was actually looking for different uh, models on how you can benchmark yourself and your strengths for written and oral communication. And to be honest, I didn't find anything I loved. Um, this was great. But um, next best thing, and uh, this is a, a tool that we've used a lot in the school business, so some of you have heard me talk about this before, but this is an assessment called Strengths Finder. Um, you've probably done something like the color code test. You maybe have done Color Me Beautiful. Good for you if you have. Um, but uh, Strengths Finder is one that uh, Gallup put out. Um, Marin, what has it been? Probably 15, 20 years now that they started that research? 50 years. Really? Okay, so it goes back way further. Um, Marin is a certified strengths coach um, here on campus. I think we only have two, maybe three now. Um, so if you're really interested, please pull her aside after. It's something I've trained on with all of my staffs and love it. So it has 34 strengths and it gives you your top five and the order of your top five matters. And so for example, I'm an achiever first and then activator, focus, belief, and competition. And within the book, you can read about each of those strengths, how they play with other strengths and what you should be leveraging in your communication. So that's one tool I wanted you to come away with today as a practical thing to go and get. Um, 
there's not very many of you here uh, today. So if you want to take this, I'll fund it out of my budget. So just go and talk to the career services team and then they'll let me know how many we need to pay for. I have a few of them left in my office. I'm up in uh, room 436. Um, so if you want to take it, it takes about a half an hour, then I'll, um, for coming today, I'll, I'll at least get you the book. It's about a $10 book. So it's not, it's not terribly expensive if you want to uh, share it with friends and other things. But for you, I'll, I'll definitely do that because I think it's important to know your strengths and then communicate based on those strengths, right? So for, I'll give you one small example. I, and then I'll ask Marin to think a little bit about one of her strengths and how that plays with oral communication, but, uh, or written. So one of mine is um, activator, and, and it's probably the number one strength that comes up when I talk to my bosses in like a formal performance review. And it's basically Blake can get shit done, right? That's basically what people have told me my whole life. If we give it to him, he's gonna get it done, right? So if I know that and I'm in a meeting and I'm communicating, maybe I should be chiming in more when it's time to decide how we're gonna get things done. One of my non-strengths is to come up with the strategic analysis behind ideas, right? I'm not an, I'm an idea generator, but I don't have a lot of strategy in my strengths. I have some, of course, but it's not one of my top strengths. So I try in meetings to be a little more quiet, unless I'm strategically focusing on building a strength, which is a good thing to do. I usually speak up more though when it's time to talk about activating an idea, okay? So that's something I learned from StrengthsFinder. Marin, you wanna give us an example maybe from yours? Thanks, Marin. So I highly recommend taking this assessment. It's one of the best ones I've ever taken. I took it when I was a freshman in college for the first time with the uh, student athletes. And it's just ever since has been something I've really valued. Um, we all know that there is an importance on communication. We can express um, a ton of emotion. So I've picked a couple video clips that, that express different emotions and, and we'll kind of talk about that next. Okay, powerful, right? Really short, the music, the situation, the setting, the fact that you find out it's related to, to smoking afterwards. Um, 
what kind of emotions are they trying to elicit here? Fear, sadness. Good. Yeah, Good. Fear marketing, right? What's the number one marketing tactic, do you guys know, from your marketing classes? I don't know if it's still true, but I can't imagine it's changed in 10 years. Sex marketing, okay? It's number one. It's always been number one, okay? Um, go to other countries that don't have as many regulations with marketing as we do, and you're going to see it in an insane amount, okay? Number two, fear marketing, right? Trump got elected based off of fear marketing. It was an actual strategy, right? And it is very effective. And, and very effective in a good way a lot of times, and very effective in bad ways too, okay? But you can get through success through fear marketing. So as you're communicating, start thinking about, okay, when I'm in a meeting, what kind of stance am I taking in this meeting? Do I wanna scare everybody in this meeting and, and create fear? Because if we don't do this initiative that I'm proposing, we're gonna fail, right? That is a tactic. I've done that before with my teams, and it's very effective, right? You shouldn't do it all the time, but it is effective. Okay, I could watch that all day, but it's a different emotion, right? What have you what do you feel during this video? Motivated, excited, right? Like heck yeah, I'm gonna go out and, and do this, right? I I watch these types of videos right before I go in for a job interview, right? For me it just pumps me up. I'm sitting there in my car, I probably look stupid, but it is such a psychological pump up that I love it. Sweet. Like the After, can we watch it at the end? Okay. It shows like images of Stu and like years past. It's like saying, hey, we're back. Like it's really cool. Cool. So I love it. Yeah, let's do it. Um, the, the emotion behind pumping people up in your communication, and, and you can do this obviously through uh, video, through oral communication, but you can do it through written, right? It, it, it takes a certain skill but you can use a tactic to pump people up. And again, there's gonna be certain situations where you're gonna to need to do that as a leader, as a team member, and, and just get everyone rallied around a cause, okay? So the last one I wanna show you, 
It's a little bit different. Still good. I cried the first two times I saw that. I don't anymore. Um, but if you want to inspire people, if you want to motivate people, just throw on some Josh Groban. You raise me up. Works every time, okay? Just clutch, right? It is very powerful, and there's a lot of reasons it's powerful. So let's see if we can identify a few. Why is this so powerful? You like empathize with the people, like, oh, that's very, you kind of get emotional there. Good, good. Yeah. Good. You see a lot of that in movies and communication. And actually, a lot of people don't realize this, but it comes down to, um, you know, Christianity has a, has a big father-son theme. And that pulls at, at a lot of hearts because it is the number one religion, at least in our country right now. And, and so people use that to their advantage in marketing and communication. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's something very human about it, right? Good. Yeah. That's such a good point, right? I love the comment about, you know, working so hard for something and, and there's a big failure, but really probably not of his own. I mean, he might have overworked before this, but we don't think about that in the moment. We're just completely sad for him, right? Um, 
I've only recently started training for something uh, like a big athletic event, and I can't imagine getting to that day and having something like this happen, right? So some of us can relate to that or, or can on multiple levels. Good. Okay, let's see. Yeah, absolutely. I can only imagine. Uh, my kids are so young. I have a daughter who's in a play right now, and so tonight or tomorrow night's the closing night. And I couldn't imagine watching something happen after she's worked so hard. Right? She's only six, but still, it's uh, that's a great point. So, I I wanted to kind of take you through it a little bit of an emotional roller coaster, right? So it's only been 30 minutes since you've been here, and you've felt probably you know sad and and inspired and pumped up and and. Those are the types of things you can do. Now, one of the main points, and we'll talk about this in a sec too, is, is the use of music and visuals. It's just becoming so much more apparent in communication nowadays that you would just be um, you know, stupid not to incorporate that into however you're trying to communicate something, right? So uh, remember that. But I wanted, so after I've taught this type of class for a whole semester, I wanted to summarize kind of the main points for you to take away as a practical uh, tool. So the first thing that you want to do when you're thinking about your written and oral communication is presenting with confidence, okay? Now, it's one thing to just be naturally confident, and that's okay. Um, I actually feel like that if you are that way, it kind of goes away after time. Um, I've, I've experienced that myself. You have to work a little harder at it the older you get. But what's the best way to have confidence in a presentation, would you think? Yeah. Uh, Good. Good. That was the number one thing on my mind too, right? You're not going to be uh, more confident than when you're prepared. Now, that's not to say that you could be the most prepared in the world, right? I have an uncle right now who's trying to start a business. Uh, going around and doing team development with companies. And the guy's more prepared than anyone I've ever seen. He has 30 binders in his office, all prepared to go and do any sort of training. It's all ready to go. He hasn't made one cold call yet, and it's been three years. Okay, he just doesn't have the confidence to go out and sell uh, his product, but he's so prepared, right? So there's this kind of balancing act. But I would say that for the most part, uh, the most confident that I've ever been when I'm presenting with my colleagues is when I'm thoroughly prepared, especially for the questions that might come after um, I'm done presenting. Okay, this is a big one, assessing the speaking situation. Okay, so I want you to take a second and you can use some notes and kind of write down, but think about the next time that you're going to have to speak with a group. It could be a group project for a class. It could be a formal presentation like this. It could be a conversation with a date this weekend. It could be, you know, I've, I've had people talk about breakups. And, you know, at your guys' age, there's a lot of uh, dating-related um, examples. It could be a difficult conversation for your, with your family, right? Um, I know Sam's doing a, a baby blessing for his twins this Sunday. He might think about that. That's sort of a presentation, right, in front of a lot of family and friends for his church. So think about something that's coming up, and I want you to assess the speaking situation and then tell me a little bit about it, okay? And we'll help you kind of assess what that's like. So take just a couple minutes and, and jot some notes down. Okay, so let's have somebody share with us their, their situation that's coming up, if you feel comfortable. Yeah, Logan. Oh, are you? Okay. So what's the assignment? What do you have to do? Okay. 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 Hey, but credibility, right? Your experience with the military and uh, uh, maybe attending this workshop was meant to be, right? There you go. Um, so let's talk about that for a sec. Who's the audience? Uh, people that are like me who want to get better at public speaking. Okay, good. 
Uh, you notice he said an informative presentation. There are different themes to different situations, right? Informative is one of those themes. So you're not necessarily having to persuade, which is another type of presentation. You're simply informing, right? And when you do an informative presentation, they can be a little bit more boring. And so you have to sort of jazz it up a little bit more when you're just trying to convey information, right? Persuasive, on the other hand, gets all sorts of fun, right? You're trying to actually get your audience, whether it's two colleagues sitting down at a table or a group this size or even larger, trying to actually persuade them to do something. You guys have been walking around with elections this week, right? Kind of annoying, kind of fun, right? That is persuasive presenting, right? Debates are persuasive presentation, right? So you have to assess the speaking situation. The, some of the best and most skilled uh, orators and written communicators are, are excellent at assessing the presentation. So, for example, when I teach this class, one of the things they have to do is persuade the audience to buy a product. Well, know your audience, right? Assess the speaking situation. These are college students. Some of them were trying to get them to spend $50 to $100 on something. Do you guys spend $50 to $100 on hardly anything? Probably not. I didn't when I was in college, right? So the best grades were given to people who could assess the situation and they were donating one to five to maybe $10, right? Because I, I graded to see if they could assess their audience. We don't spend enough time thinking about that. Okay, let's go to like Jedi level assessing the situation. Okay, so I know my boss, right? His name's Dave. I know Dave has five strengths because he's taken this, right? Okay, so maybe I go take those five strengths I go read about him in this book. I'm trying to pitch him a really big presentation right now, actually. So I go take those strengths and I learn about what is going to make Dave be convinced in a persuasive presentation on something I'm trying to pitch him, right? It's going to take me an hour to two hours just to do this step to prepare for that meeting, okay? Whereas most people would probably go into the meeting and be like, ah, it's Dave. He's going to say no anyway right? That's kind of his reputation. These guys will laugh at that, right? And he might, right? But if I do this well enough, right, he's not going to. Because I know Dave. I know what he, he cares about. He cares about placement and money, right? So you have to assess the speaking situation and add value to that. Okay, so we've talked about this a little bit. I don't want to spend too much time here, but prep is huge, right? Um, doing your research on your facts. Now, What's interesting is we'll talk later uh, in a sec about skill and, and assessing the speaking situation. So I love picking on Donald Trump, okay? President Trump is an amazing communicator. You may not think so, and when I say amazing, I'm not saying that in a good way or a bad way. I, I tend to think negatively but um, on his situations, but I cannot, I cannot ignore the fact that how well he, he does at assessing a speaking situation. Because he's even gotten to the point where he can throw all research out the door and convince an audience that he's right about something, right? It, he, he can do it, and it's amazing, right? And sometimes uh, we get a little too buried in the data and the research, and we don't realize that we're talking to humans with emotion, right? He realized that, and he crushed it, okay? It was, it was, it was, it was amazing to watch, okay? Especially because I was teaching this class during the election. And it was just fascinating to analyze each one of those debates and each one of those rallies and situations and just see how good uh, it is at doing this, okay? So just know the power of communication that way. But if you want more credibility in when you're speaking, you really want to spend some time in the data. You're at a research university. Okay, you might not know the importance of that. I didn't when I was your age, but let me give you an example. I've written the two biggest things I've ever written down in life were a book I did with my brother and my dissertation for my doctorate program. Okay, so very two very different things. Okay, the book I did was completely opinion based. It was my brother and I sitting in a room and then going out and getting mentors, really credible mentors, but mentors nonetheless, and we did know what they call empirical research or evidence about our ideas. We simply wrote them down in Microsoft Word, we paid for a fancy graphic designer and editor, and we published the book. 
okay? And we sold it to a publishing company. It was completely our opinion. Is that a bad thing? No, Stephen Covey made hundreds of millions of dollars doing this. I was his intern, I talked to him about this. One of his biggest regrets was that he didn't do empirical res research on the Seven Habits book. But he made $125 million off of it, right? So sometimes your opinion is good enough, okay? But we're at a research university, and for someone like that to publish a book and get, for example, tenure as a professor, that's not, that's not the route, okay? So now you take my dissertation. Something I wrote, not my opinion. Maybe at first it was a hypothesis is what we'd call that, right? But you have to go through the scientific method. You have to go do a literature review. You have to see what's out there. You have to support your, your hypothesis with evidence. Then you actually have to test it, okay? So my, evidence, my hypothesis was that if I implemented a certain college readiness curriculum with middle school students, right, then I could get them a little further along than their peers who weren't taking this curriculum. So I had to have one class doing it, one class not, I had to combine it, did all sorts of statistical stuff that I still to this day don't really understand but paid my tutor to help me understand. And boom, I've got a dissertation, right? And it is proven fact, and I can say that in a citation with my name that I have proved this thing, okay? That's what a research uni university does, right? So when you're communicating to people, you have to make sure you're backing it up with legit citations. Don't get buried in the whole MLA versus APA and the right type of citation at your age now. When you get a little older, yeah, you have to do that the right way or you just look dumb. But at your age, just get used to using citations and backing up your arguments with true evidence from things like journals and other peer-reviewed dissertation or articles and not opinion-based media, right? Or opinion-based literature. Does that make sense, the difference between those two? Okay, so if I'm trying to prove something in middle schools when I go work with them, I'm gonna quote my dissertation and not my other book. Where do you go to find uh, like citations or like real Yeah, that's a great, I, it's a great question. Um, so, it's the cliche answer, right? The library. Now, we do have a physical library, and that's great, but our digital library is so much better. And so when you learn about things like EBSCOhost um, and, and these information literacy classes, if you're really interested in what I'm talking about right now, go take an information literacy class, either officially through, through the College of Humanities or through the library um, informally, and they'll teach you exactly how to do that. I had 117 citations in my dissertation. Right? That's the level of, of, of research that goes into something when you're trying to prove facts. So if I'm, going back to my example with my boss, if I'm trying to prove something because I want to implement something coming this next year, I'm going to back up, whether it's in an email or in person, I'm going to back it up with citations. Okay? So I know a lot about him, I'm going to be confident about it, and I'm really well prepared, not just physically in my prep, but also in my written communication with uh, the research that I've done, okay? All right, I'm gonna pivot a little bit here and talk about a story that happened with my Uncle Joey this last Saturday, okay? This is wild. So Joey's kind of, it's on my dad's side of the family. It's kind of a strange family that I'm part of. A lot of, let's just say the family reunions are very interesting, right? Um, the, he hasn't been uh, sleeping a lot because he's been traveling a ton. So he was in the Atlanta airport uh, on Saturday night and he gets really nervous before he flies. He doesn't fly a whole lot. Um, and so he went to the bar and he started having a couple drinks at the bar. Well, this lady, I guess, sat next to him, okay? And she was in this really kind of kind of skimpy red dress and looked like she was ready to go to some gala or something and she came and sat next to him and she started drinking with him a little bit. Well, I guess Sunday morning rolls around, he wakes up, he can't remember anything that had happened over Saturday night and he's in a hotel room in a bathtub full of ice. So he's sitting there, his clothes are all off, he's in this bathtub full of ice and he notices a tube coming out of his body and there's a note on the toilet right there that said, your kidneys have been removed, one of your kidneys has been removed, you're okay, call 911. And his cell phone was sitting right there. <laughs> okay? Okay, this story's not real, right? I just made that up. 
all right? But that is a proven story. I don't know if you've heard of the Heath brothers. One was at Stanford, one was at Duke. And they, ma they wrote a book called Made to Stick about communication. And this book talks about the power of storytelling. It is researched that that specific story, if I ask you 20 years from now, that you'll be able to retell it to me. Why? Yeah. So outlandish and crazy that it just may stick. Okay, so when you're telling stories and you're communicating, sometimes the outlandish and the crazy is a good thing. It's gonna stick, right? Good, that's one thing. Let's get a little deeper. What were some details in that story that I told that sort of make you or help you remember things? Carly. Like the way that you said, you know, like the family, kind of talk about your family or your unions just kind of crazy. Yeah. It made it so like I wanted to pay attention because it validated. Yeah. Story. I kind of set it up a little bit, right? Great. What else? Yeah. I think that same part about the family also made it relatable because a lot of times like people have extended family that's like a little bit different. Oh yeah, we all have that <laughs> uncle, right? <laughs> like Uncle Joe is a real person in everyone's family, oh, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I the colors just a lot of like vivid descriptions of like perfect people. senses. Color, right? I forgot, I, I didn't tell it as well as I should have. There's, I should have incorporated smell, okay? Uh, maybe the perfume that she had on, right? Could have, could have created a sort of sense with smell. But we had colors. What else do we have in, sort of, in terms of senses? Logan. Of Good, visuals, right? Maybe the red dress, the skimpy red dress, right? Those kinds of things create different um, ideas and, and images. When you guys are communicating, you cannot get away from storytelling, okay? When we market the Huntsman School, the most effective thing that we can do, especially with high school students right now, is tell stories about you. Every time you walk down the halls of Huntsman Hall or EVB and you see a picture of somebody and the placement of the awesome job or internship they got, we're telling you a story, okay? When we Watch those videos at the beginning of this presentation. They were stories. The most effective communication, both written and oral, you will get away with are incorporating stories. Okay, so please remember that. All right, we won't harp on this too much because we've talked about it a lot, but please remember the use of visuals in everything that you do with your presentations and your written communication. Uh, we can't get away with it now. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to see the change of uh, especially media within marketing. Um, we've gone from sort of a cinematic movie experience as in, in the entertainment world to a much shorter uh, visual experience, right? You can see it in, in businesses like uh, the movie theater industry declining right now, uh, quite drastically actually. But then you see things like Netflix and especially YouTube kind of on the rise. Uh, we're, we're moving towards not just visuals, I think we're all well aware of that over the last 10 years um, as you guys have grown up, but not just that, but, but much shorter um, sort of attention spans, I guess you would say. So when you are, it's true, right? Um, when you are thinking about how to communicate, please um, remember kind of brevity, right? It's, it's good to be pithy in, in your communication many times. Right? I've learned this from uh, actually contrasting two different supervisors of mine. One was every time I got an email, it was 300 words or more, and it just was kind of exhausting, uh, but that was his style of communication. Whereas I would say more in a business school setting, it's, it's much more brief, and I've learned to kind of transition to that kind of communication and, and in fact, like it more. Um, we, we can say more with less if that makes any sense. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is this delivering with skill. There are certain skills that you need to practice when you're presenting. So let's kind of throw out some of them. If we're thinking about a public speaking situation like this today, what are some of the skills that you would think about? Yeah. Um, uh, skills in delivering a presentation. I think we talked about confidence already. Good. So. So maybe confidence can be expressed a little bit through maybe posture, for example, and physical confidence, right? So I'm out in front of this podium today. I'm trying to show that I feel comfortable with you. Um, I'm standing, you're sitting. We have uh, more of a 
kind of a half moon shape classroom. These are all things that you should assess before you're going into a presentation and how that's gonna happen, right? Um, the way you dress, the way you speak, how fast you speak, how slow you speak. Logan, you had something? Yeah, I was just like saying like tone, being able to put out with clarity, having eye contact. Good, tone's a huge thing. People don't practice that enough. There were certain people who would speak in my com communications classes and they would be either so loud and scary sometimes or so soft and and if and really the most skilled presenters can do both right they can kind of weave it in and out in a presentation when they want you to feel certain emotions but the most boring is when it's just flat tone the entire time it's like series giving the presentation to you right i changed my siri to be a british man because i wanted to feel like i had like a butler like batman or something like that but um when i hear that voice it's like the most even tone like can you imagine you know 10 20 minutes with someone speaking like that you need to practice your tone good one what else yeah your gestures like how far you're going with your hands stuff like that good Yeah, and, that's, and these sort of come natural a little bit, right? I've been told by a presentation coach that I use too many hand gestures, right? I have to rein it in a little bit. Some of you may be told opposite. You might be standing like this or not moving around the room and you might look kind of stiff as a board or, or nervous that way, whereas I may come across a little bit maybe over-enthusiastic and have to rein it in. I had one kid that would give a presentation and he would rub his stomach. Was that was his natural like instinct and the whole class was like, what? <laughs> like every time he'd get up and give his presentation and boom it would just be like this rubbing of the stomach I'm like ah oh. like I had to work really hard with him on getting away from that right the pen clicking right we talk about in job interview prep right uh, the different ticks that we have during an interview so I know to stay away from certain things because again going back to the color me beautiful video and the strengths finder right you you need to know yourself you need to be self-aware of how you come across and then be coachable, right? You need to be able to receive constructive criticism. There's been a few faculty who, after I've presented, even since being here in my career, that have come up to me after and say, hey, maybe you should change this a little bit. Thank you, you know, and I have tried to work on that. So make sure that you're open to uh, critique in all of these areas, yeah. Well, I think part of that too is like knowing yourself. One of my biggest things is when my hair is down when I'm presenting, I play with it. Yeah. And I don't think about it. Yeah. So now whenever I present, I always do a half up. So it's out of the way, it's not even a problem. Yeah. And so being like conscious and that's like the prep, the assessing, and just also knowing yourself. Cool. Thank you. So I am out of time. I wanted to let you guys know that hopefully this is a little bit more practical. Please come see me if you want to talk about it more. I want to watch the athletics video that Mary Beth brought up. So I'll pull that up. But if you need to leave, that's fine. We do have the leadership uh, forum speaker starting in nine minutes up in Perry Pavilion. It should be excellent. Former uh, Utah State alumnus and uh, former Utah president of the Senate. A very good conversation about the sort of weaving of politics and business.